good evening everyone who's watching us in india and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone else uh, from the other parts of the world i'm latika associate vice president at imei it gives me immense pleasure to tell you that we have around 45% international speakers 30% women speakers and 30% international delegates watching this and viewing this largest virtual global fintech fest today which is organized by fintech convergence council of imei and npci This conference is presented by Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, and Reserve Bank of India, and powered by Amazon Pay, and brought to you by WhatsApp and Google Pay. To continue with the conference, we have another exciting panel discussion that would help us get a grasp on the financial health beyond financial inclusion. Here with us are our esteemed moderator, Audrey, Research and Insights Asia (UNCDS). Hi, Audrey. We have our panelist. Paul, who's research lead at FSD Kenya, Genevieve, director of insights and evidence at Spin Institute, and Evelyn, assistant vice president, MetLife Foundation. It's a rare opportunity to have such a great expert panel with us. I would request all the delegates to keep sending us your questions, and I'll make sure that we pass it on to the panelists. Without any further ado, uh, Audrey, I would request you to take it up. Uh, thank you very much, Latika, for that introduction. Um, so, hello, everybody. My name is Audrey. I represent uh, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, um, and I'm joined today by very distinguished panelists uh, who have done a lot of work on financial health. Um, our session today is entitled "Financial Health Beyond Financial Inclusion," and in this session, we're going to look at the approach of financial health, unpack it a little bit, look at how it's related to financial inclusion. And then cap it off by discussing how we can operationalize the approach of financial health. Like, what could stakeholders like you and me do in the context that we find ourselves in? Right, the global pandemic that's unfolding um, and laying bare a lot of financial struggles um, all around us. Um, so globally, we've made a lot of progress on financial inclusion, um, and I suppose most of you watching will agree. Uh, what I mean by that is that over the last decade. Um, We have included millions of people into the formal financial system. Um, a lot more people today have bank accounts, or are able to access digital credit, or are able to send money home to their families through remittances um, than they were able to do so 10 years ago. Uh, but played into impact that they are financially secure or financially resilient. In other words. Does financial inclusion mean? Um, and in order to examine that question, um, I'd like to invite our first panelist, uh, Paul Gubbins, who is the research lead for financial sector deepening Kenya. Uh, Paul has a framework that he will share with us, and I'll also uh, point us to a few research studies that have examined uh, this relationship between financial inclusion and financial health or well-being. Paul, over to you. All right. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Audrey. Um, yeah. So as you mentioned, I'll, I'll just start by laying out a framework for understanding financial health and its determinants, um, and then I'll touch on how financial inclusion relates to financial health globally, looking at some of the available cross-country data, and then reference some specific evidence from Kenya. <clears throat> so let me just start by saying that there's really no consensus definition that describes financial health. Yeah, but there are common areas of overlap, um, which you know, uh, among the institutions that have have advanced definitions of their own. Um, but financial health is evident when an adult or household can meet their basic needs in the present, um, when they can cope with and absorb risk without incurring additional financial or material hardship, and when they are are able to grow income or capital through investment. That's sometimes referred to as fulfilling goals or, or seizing opportunities. Um, these capabilities have pretty clear markers or manifestations. Um, you know, some of those are, are, are quite, uh, you know, experiences that we all share, for example, you know, occasionally missing a bill payment, but, but others are more severe. You know, in Kenya, for example, it's quite common for families to skip meals or reduce food consumption. Uh, children are sent home from school when fees aren't paid. People frequently forego or delay healthcare. So these these markers are, are much more severe and carry more significant um, in, impacts for the individual and, and for society at large. I'd argue that there are five 
um, key pillars of, uh, of financial health, income, wealth, social capital, um, policies and laws, and financial behaviors. Uh, most, of, most of these are, are self-explanatory, but let me just touch on what I mean by social capital. This is basically the networks of relationships people have that are based on trust and mutual support. Um, in places where you know accumulating accumulating capital and wealth is difficult, or among people where where the propensity to save is quite low, you know social capital stands in for wealth in the sense that it it, it is often deployed or tapped to help families deal with risk and even to seize investment opportunities. Policies and laws encompasses you know not just social nets and and social um, the social safety nets and, and social insurance, but um, you know other worker protections and benefits. Um, the, the design of the pension system, collective bargaining, and, and other factors that that influence um, you know the resources available to families and and uh, the structure of, of the labor market. Um, and then there's financial behaviors, of course, which is at the heart of, of financial inclusion, um, which has to do with how how people you know plan, spend, and save, uh, which determines how allocate their available income to different uses and, and shapes how they can tra transform income in, in, into wealth uh, in the long run. Um, so the, the, let me just, you know, the relative importance of these pillars, I think, varies uh, depending on the country context. So if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to, to directly address the question that, that Audrey raised, which is what is the relationship between financial inclusion and financial health. And here I'm, I'm drawing on data from the Global Findex. Um, ask question of whether an adult would be able to raise the equivalent of 1 20th of, of gross national income in the period of 30 days. And so that's what's on the Y axis. And along the X axis is the percentage of the adult population with access to an account. And so the general picture is that there is there is a positive relationship, um, but but it's it's fairly weak, especially among countries with where less than eighty percent of of the population um, has access to account. And there's a lot of variation. Um, you know, just I've highlighted there: Kenya, India, and China. You know, both have made impressive gains in financial inclusion. You know, over uh, eighty percent of the population there has access to, to an account. Um, but the difference is at that level of, of, of inclusion in, in financial resilience are, are quite substantial. So I think it's important to recognize that <clears throat> there are the, the importance of these of these other factors and that really financial inclusion, when we're evaluating the, the, the impact or the potential of financial inclusion interventions, it's important to see how they fit in to these broader pillars. So I, I just want to go to the next slide. Um, Quickly, um, again, this is showing the data from the Global Findex, and it shows how res how resilient adults would be able to um, where they get the, the the source of emergency money. Um, and you see that across the low and middle income world, labor income and, and social capital are the two key pillars of financial resilience. And it's not until you get until higher um, income levels that personal savings replaces the social network, and to a lesser degree. Um, labor income uh, as a source of um, resilience. Um, so I, I, in Kenya specifically, you know, formal financial inclusion interventions, you can go to the next slide, have moved rapidly on, on three fronts, um, building an accessible digital payments infrastructure that accommodates cash and lowers the cost of transactions between people and firms. Um, expanding access to personal accounts to help manage financial resources and, and expanding access to formal digital credit. Well done stuff in each of these domains that have um, shown a positive relationship between financial inclusion and financial health. Um, and, and mobile money, what, what it really achieved was that it built on, on one of Kenya's key strengths, the social capital pillar, and enabled that capital to work more effectively to support resilience um, between people. Um, but I would argue that that um, you can go to the next slide. That you know, it, it, it's important to have these 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 experimental studies. But it's I think it's also important to have a um, broader population measures of financial health, because often what we're seeing now is that 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 macroeconomic effects can can overwhelm these benefits. So, just wanted to draw your attention to the blue boxes there. This is um, 
the percentage of the adult population that there are fi financially healthy per FSD Kenya's um, measure of financial health. And in a period where financial inclusion was growing, financial health uh, declined from about 38% to 21%, 38% in, in mid-2015 to 21% to um, towards the end of 2018. And so, <clears throat> I, it, that, for, you know, for this reason, it's important for us to take a broader look at, at the forces that shape people's financial well-being, not just their, their access to financial services. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I hope that was in the four minute. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you, Paul. Thank you for laying out that relationship between inclusion and health. I mean, it's it's not very clear, but there is some direct evidence also linking the two concepts. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit in our conversation. Um, I'd like to call upon Genevieve Melfort, um, who is joining us from the U.S. Um, she's the director of insights and evidence at Aspen. But formerly, uh, Genevieve worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB in the U.S., uh, Genevieve, you do a lot of work on financial health uh, for Aspen, but you also did some great research work on financial well-being um, in the U.S. So could you tell us a little bit about your work um, and also tell us um, what did you uncover about financial health? Like, what is it? How, do you, how would you define it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Audrey. And thanks so much for having me here and to the conference organizers. Um, Evelyn and Paul are two people that I really admire, so it's delightful to be on this panel with them. So, um, as you mentioned, I did work at the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and I spent about six years there researching the concept of consumer financial well-being. And I think for the purposes of our panel today, we're really going to use those terms of financial health and well-being um, kind of interchangeably. Um, and so I researched what is financial well-being, how can it be measured, uh, and what supports it. Um, so, uh, and I guess I'll just say again, I think this really, everything Paul said completely resonates. I'm using the term financial well-being. He was using the term financial health. Um, I didn't see his presentation before just now. Uh, it resonates so much. I'll be using slightly different words, but I, I hope it comes through to our audience today um, how consistent these concepts and kind of the underlying components really are from our respective work, which I think is very cool because we've used entirely different methodologies to kind of come to the same conclusions. Um, so, and, and just also to reiterate that I really think that when we talk about financial health and financial well-being, we're thinking of those as kind of a state of being for a consumer, a family, a person, a household, right? They're the intended outcome of financial inclusion, other government economic policies, Etc. Right. I don't think we mean that they're the same thing. The question that we're exploring now is kind of what is financial health and well-being, and and how do we think about the contribution of financial inclusion to that kind of outcome goal for for families and consumers? Um, okay. So next slide, please, Latika. So in a nutshell, what did we learn about financial well-being in the U.S.? So I think these themes are totally consistent with uh, Paul's overall summary about financial health. Um, in a nutshell, financial well-being means having enough money and resources to comfortably meet your needs and obligations, protect you from shocks, pursue your goals, and this one might be slightly different, enjoy life. So if there is any distinction at all between financial health and well-being, it may be that kind of additive factor around kind of subjective enjoyment on top of those kind of more objective financial concepts that Paul talked about. You know, can you pay your bills? Are you resilient to shocks? Um, do you have the financial systems that allow you to be on track to meet your goals, et cetera? Um, so this definition includes dimensions of both security and freedom of choice. Um, and uh, both your situation in the present and if you're on track to have those things in the future. Um, and another thing I, I want to share about what we've really learned through many years of research on this concept, concept in the U.S. is even though there is an aspect of this overall definition that is inherently subjective, right, this piece about what are your own financial goals, what, 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 is it, what are the choices that will allow you as an individual to enjoy life, right? So there is a subjective aspect to this, as well as kind of the more um, objective factors around financial health that Paul talked through. But what we've learned um, from a lot of research now in the US is that it's the objective facts of a person's life 
in particular, their income, expenses, savings, and other financial cushions that drive their sense of financial security and well being. So, in other words, people's sense of financial well being is very much grounded in their kind of objective financial reality. Um, and what I've learned through my research at the CFPB and over the last few years at the Aspen Institute um, is that a person or household's ability to have financial well being requires three things. And Latika, next slide, please. I think you'll see um, how similar at a high level these are to what Paul just talked about, which is great. So the first and what I consider really the foundational pillar is um, routinely positive cash flow, by which I mean that the money coming into your household, and as Paul said, that can either be labor income or transfers, right? Non-labor income, income comes from many sources, um, that you have stable and sufficient income relative to cost of living, right? And that's how you get positive cash flow at least most of the time. And that's really the foundation of financial uh, health and well being uh, in my read of the research. So when people have that, at least most of the time, they can meet their ongoing needs and obligations. And it's that kind of net income, right? It's the positive nature of the cash flow that gives people the extra money that then they can put towards savings. So that's the second pillar, really, is a household's balance sheet or their personal financial resources. And, and as Paul kind of noted to us in his cross-country analysis, what that looks like for a household might differ based on their context. So um, in some of the wealthier countries, liquid savings is a really big part of that, as he just showed you. Um, but of course, also that kind of social capital network um, is super important, actually, in frankly, in the U.S., as well as in other parts of the world. Um, when we interviewed people around the U.S., what you know, what financial well-being looks like in their lives, many people talked about how you know a parent or an adult child would help them if something extraordinary went wrong. So, I mean, that I think that's a relevant concept everywhere. Um, you know, private insurance and other forms of assets and wealth really make up this second pillar of, of personal resources. And the personal resources provide households with resilience against kind of day-to-day -day routine financial shocks as well as the means to invest in family well-being, asset building, and economic mobility. Um, but what I think it's important to emphasize that personal resources usually, for almost everyone, cannot do is protect your financial well-being against larger or really persistent shocks, like a job loss or major medical expense. Um, as we are unfortunately seeing out, seeing play out in the wake of COVID-19, right? So there are some shocks that are just too big for even the most financially responsible person to kind of self-insure against, um, which is why the third pillar of financial well-being is social safety nets. So those are provided by government, employers, or other institutions, and they are really critical to provide and maintain security in the face of those large shocks. These institutions also actually often have a key role to play in supporting households in building assets and investing in economic mobility as well. So kind of government, employer, and other institutions play a big role in people's ability to build personal wealth as well as kind of the social insurance that shields them from big shocks. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much going to leave it here. The final thing I just want to note, kind of speaking to our, our the central question of our, uh, of our panel today, is that all three of those pillars implicate a suite of financial products and systems that households need to safely and affordably receive payments, make payments, save and invest for the short and long term, borrow and insure themselves. Um, so, so that's, you know, at the highest level, my sense of what the connection is between financial inclusion or inclusive financial systems. I have hat tip to Evelyn for really making me understand that it's the inclusive systems that we ought to be thinking about. Um, uh, you know, the implication is that that, you know, the products and systems are needed to support those three pillars. Right. So, of course, we can't uh, assume that in and of itself, that inclusive financial products and systems are going to get people all the way to financial health and well-being, but they have a key role to play. It's pretty darn hard to have effective safety nets, cash flow and personal resources without safe and affordable products and systems. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. No, it is comforting, as you noted, that everything that you presented on financial well-being um, in the American context resonates so deeply with also what Paul presented from an entirely different context. Um, and even though there is no shared understanding of financial health, what I have also seen in all of the research that um, I have done, like by just kind of looking at the studies that you guys are doing, that these components tend to resonate across contexts. Um, 
So on that note, um, I'd like to invite Evelyn Stark, who is um, a financial health expert um, and the Assistant Vice President at MetLife Foundation. And I must note that MetLife Foundation has done some tremendous work um, on financial health. Um, so Evelyn, it'll be uh, really great to hear from you on the kind of work MetLife does. But I would love it if you could, and I think the audience would benefit a lot from hearing um, uh, from you um, as to why financial health is important. Why do you think uh, we should consider financial health as an approach, especially in the context we find ourselves in currently? Great. Thank you, Audrey. And thanks to everybody at the Global FinTech Festival, all of the organizers and my colleagues on this panel. All of you are from organizations that we at MetLife Foundation look to for great research. So MetLife Foundation has been focused on financial health for the last seven years, and we focused on financial health uh, in part because of our footprint of work. It includes India and Bangladesh, places where financial inclusion is very well understood, uh, but it also included the U.S. and the U.K. Um, in the U.S., uh, the U.K., it was much less clear. You know, 95% of people in the U.S. have an account, so they're included. Uh, then you look at the research, like Genevieve has just shown you, you know, closer to 30% of Americans are financially healthy. Um, so, you know, we had a choice. Do we, do we uh, use the same terms in different contexts, um, or would financial health be relevant to the rest of our footprint? Um, and that's when we looked at it, and, you know, we realized that uh, development professionals, basically all of the people in the virtual room right now, um, really aren't, uh, in theory, focused on something as simple and binary as people having an account or not having an account, being included or excluded, but that all of us have had a deeper goal, and that's to ensure that people were resilient and able to access opportunities. So even if I look at definitions of financial inclusion, it does not, nobody, I think, has a definition that says has one account, has a payments account, has a savings account. It talks about, you know, suites of products and all of that. So I think financial health is just a stronger term. Um, and our partners uh, that we work with um, in Asia, Latin America, and beyond the U.S. have all reacted to it quite well, um, and we've reached more than 13 million low-income folks. To your question, and I think you're asking me this because I'm the oldest person here, um, I've been working in this field for 25 years. 25 years ago, this was called micro-enterprise credit, and it was enterprise because it was all about micro-businesses. Um, and it was mostly rural and peri-urban. Of course, the field evolved. We dropped microenterprise. We became microcredit. Then we started realizing that we were charging people for this credit, so they weren't actually beneficiaries. They were customers. And so we started thinking about customer centricity, talking to them about what they actually wanted. People wanted liquid saving services. They wanted to build up a financial cushion. They wanted to plan for education, housing, old age, um, many things basically that would build their financial health. Um, and so that's when we became microfinance uh, as well. And then all of a sudden we had microfinance institutions, banks, microinsurers, insurers, telcos, everybody offering services. And that's when we started calling it financial inclusion. So I kind of think that as we're coming to the term financial health, that it's a part of the natural evolution. And if anything, it's getting back to our roots, that our products and services are really about providing the tools to enable our customers to build financial health. So in some ways, I think it took us 25 years to get back here. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're in a good spot because now we have better infrastructure, policy, and research and thinking about what, uh, what our goals are and how to get there. Even if, as my colleagues have said, we don't have a shared definition of financial health, I, I still think that's okay as long as we have a shared view of where the future should look. So thank you again. Um. Thank you, Evelyn, uh, for, for that overview. Um, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. Um, so let me just kind of um, ask some of these questions to our panelists. 
Uh, one of the questions is about um, the context we find ourselves in, and we spoke about this a little bit. Uh, we're in the midst of a global pandemic um, that is really exposing um, the instability of our financial and social systems, right? Um, so the question is about what should we do to improve the financial health? Um, I would situate this in terms of what stakeholders could do. Um, I know the audience that joins us today is a, is a mix of the private sector, but also policymakers. So to our panelists, you could really pick one stakeholder or more um, and, and, and give us your thoughts on what would improve the financial health of end clients. Um, Paul, Paul, would you, would you like to go first? I'm um, curious to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I wanted to reference a chart in 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 in, in, uh, in a slide, but but it, but but that's completely right. I mean, I I think the pandemic has put into sharp relief just how relevant um, financial health is. Um, so I wanted to to show a chart based on the 2018 Gallup Financial Health Survey, which was also I th MetLife Foundation was also in, involved in in implementing this, um, and the chart shows countries the share of adults that would be able to meet basic needs in the event they lost their income uh, as time elapses. So it's essentially a financial survivorship curve. And by week 10, you see that less than one in three adults in, in Kenya, Vietnam, Greece, Chile, Colombia, and Bangladesh um, would still be making ends meet. So in the current situation, a crisis that you know that requires prolonged social distancing amidst widespread unemployment and income loss, you can see why low levels of financial health um, uh, puts a lot of pressure on governments um, to, to either relax social distancing mandates, um, perhaps earlier than, than, than desired or optimal from a public health standpoint, or um, to deploy resources, um, relief resources uh, really quickly. Um, so I would say that you know, one policy area that deserves renewed attention is um, social protection. So governments or, or the part of governments that, that are involved in, in designing social policy, I think should be working closely together with the financial sector to identify gaps in, in the infrastructure um, and to make uh, the, the technology investments that remove the friction in, in the delivery of um, and in such a way that, you know, assistance can be automatically scaled quickly in the event of, of, of emergencies. Um, and that, that includes the, the information investments to be able, that, that are necessary for targeting. Um, you know, in Latin America, for example, um, uh, you know, there, there's a, a vast non-poor population that, that um, is kind of at the cusp and, and is in quite precarious financial um, you know situations and that's true for for other countries but in 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 the latin america region you've seen that um governments have kind of scrambled to figure out how to how to give support to to these uh, very big population groups that that were not already kind of included in the envelope of of of, of social social protection um and in places where there wasn't or hasn't been, or or there isn't a good good infrastructure for delivering assistance. You know, you've had long queues in 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 front of banks, or even here in Chile, where where I live now. You know, government giving boxes of food that took a long time to to distribute, um, and, and probably weren't very cost effective. So, I think I think governments should really take a close look at 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 this area, um, and and see how they can leverage, uh, you know modern modern information technology tools to make um to make these these the, the, yeah to make social protection more fit more 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 responsive <clears throat> um and and uh, uh and, and more responsive to 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 emergencies um great no thank you thank you very much for, for that response and for laying emphasis on social safety nets um they're more relevant than ever, right? Um, we have very interesting audience questions coming up. Um, and um, there is one question that I would like to ask Evelyn. Um, one of our audience members wants to know how fintechs can improve the financial health 
of the digital age consumer. Um, I thought you could speak to your experience with MetLife, but also earlier um, and um, so, sort of share your ex uh, thoughts and experiences. Sure, thank you. Um, I uh, also want to agree with Paul uh, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else. And going back to Genevieve's point, income has to be higher than expenses uh, uh, in order to be heading towards financial health. So in the U.S., you see a lot of people who are getting income either through charitable donation or through government um, are actually banking it. They're saving it. Um, and so the, the, they are expecting this crisis to last longer and so they're saving it. So one thing I think uh, that's important about why I'm saying this, even though you asked me a slightly different question, um, is that people given cash will handle it in a way that's best for their families. So I, I think that that's a point that we need to think about. The sec one thing that we did find in the U.S. is that a lot of people couldn't actually access the cash. And this is where I am getting to your question around digital. Um, and fintechs have been leveraged very effectively um, in distributing cash during COVID-19. Uh, um, and not just here in the U.S., but uh, more broadly. So I think that they have a, a huge role to play. The, other role to play that fintechs, I think, just more generally um, beyond COVID-19 and, and specifically fintechs in the development space is to realize and think about consumer protection um, and how we're going to um, monitor ourselves and our peers. So Paul's in Kenya, so he can certainly talk to this more than I can. Um, but all usage is not good usage of digital financial of digital tools. So um, the ease of um, access to your cash on a Friday or Saturday night or during a uh, international football match is not necessarily a good thing for your financial health if you're going to bet on uh, games, if you're going to decide to buy a round of drinks at the bar. So, um, or if we make access to consumers so easy that payday lender, consumer lenders, bad lenders are able to easily access uh, and our customers, particularly with unclear messaging. Um, and I, I think Kenya, unfortunately, knows that all too well. Uh, the U.S., of course, knows that all too well. So I think FinTech has a huge role to play. Um, its ability to break down distance, um, to make things easier. Um, but it has to be careful on the other side. Are we leaving women out? Are we leaving people without uh, smartphones out? Are we leaving out the very people that we care about? So. Lots of potential and um, lots of uh, risk. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, you know, for specifically sort of laying out uh, the potential trade-offs of what fintech can make available, but also um, uh, you know the financial health aspect of um, um, of, of of end customers, um, especially digital age consumers, as this question specified. Um, uh, I was originally going to ask you guys a bunch of questions, but I think we're going to pivot slightly because there's some really interesting questions from the audience. Um, there is one by um, Lucania Makundo, um, and her question is specific to uh, Genevieve. Um, so Genevieve, let me read out Lucania's, Lucania's question to you. Um, she talks about um, your model, uh, which emphasized enjoying life or the happiness aspect of financial health. Um, and so she says that makes a lot of sense, but how do you measure this? Um, and what sorts of indicators did you use? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, and fortunately, I have something for you. <laughs> So in our work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, because uh, our research led us to this definition that did incorporate aspects of kind of personal preferences and happiness, when we worked to find a way to quantify that overall concept, it, it had to include those aspects as well. So um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has created, and uh, there are tons of tools about how to use it, and it's all available at consumerfinance.gov. 
something that they call um, the financial well-being scale. It's a series of, there's a 10 question version and a five question version um, of these scale questions that get at all aspects of the financial well-being definition and can be scored to produce one number, um, which actually fascinatingly that, uh, so that gets used a lot now in kind of survey research and program evaluations in the US, but it's deployed widely in Brazil and in other places where people have found that this definition and the concept uh, really resonate in, in many different markets. So just to give you two really concrete examples of like some statements that make up the scale speaking to this happiness angle. Several of the statements are things like because of my money situation, I feel like I will never have the things I want in life and people kind of agree, disagree on a five point scale or something like I can enjoy life because of the way I'm managing my money. So those are just two examples of the kind of more subjective satisfaction related uh, questions that make up that overall scale. But please go to consumerfinance.gov uh, for more information on the whole scale, how to use it, how to score it. Thanks. Um, thank you, Chen. Um, we we have about five minutes. Um, there is one question that I think we could try and address. Um, I'll, I'll read the question out and maybe each panelist can spend about a minute. It's, it's probably difficult to answer this question in a minute, but maybe you could you could try. Uh, there is a question by Joss Preet um, Singh, which relates to uh, the private sector. So he asks, how does financial how sorry uh, how does financial how does the financial health aspect translate for businesses who are already delivering financial products and services uh, what does financial health mean for businesses um, and how is it different from what they're already doing on financial inclusion uh, so i uh, just to kind of summarize that um, how should businesses look at financial health Evelyn, do you want to take that question? Sure, sure. I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Um, I, I think a lot of times uh, financial institutions assume that they are delivering financial health products, uh, especially institutions in our space. Uh, very few of us uh, in development are trying to, develop, to design bad products. Um, that doesn't mean that we're maximizing the utility of our products uh, to meet the goals that our customers want, um, to give them that feeling that Genevieve was just talking about, that they actually are, a, that our tools are helping them manage their funds um, for both risks and for opportunities. So I think measuring and, and one thing I would say is that in, in markets where most people don't have income and ex income above expenses on a, on a regular basis, we have to rethink how we measure this. And then, so creating that measurement is a key issue. And then for institutions to start measuring it with their customers um, it is relevant to how you tweak your product how you make it more relevant and more useful to uh, meeting your customers' financial health goals. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, does any other panelists uh, want to jump in? We have about two minutes. I think Genevieve raised her hand. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'm say two, to follow up two. if there's time. I'll be I'll be really quick here because I'm eager to hear from you, Paul. So my my first thought, which is totally in line with what Evelyn just said, is first focus on the functionalities of like what what are the financial functionalities people need in their lives for financial health? And I I think it's pretty clear from our sort of suite of presentations today that there's really we know what that is. There's a lot of consensus on that, right? So people need to be able to safely and affordably receive money, send money, save money, you know, borrow responsibly, insure themselves, et cetera, right? So, um, the, you know, the first question is the function, the financial health functionality that you're designing for in a product. But the second thing I'll add is to not forget the importance of kind of user-centered design. So there's both the financial functionality, but I actually think a huge form of inclusive financial systems and products are that, they are truly designed to be you know, intuitive and user-friendly. So just to say, I think that's a whole nother layer that is a significant, actually a significant component to a product that meaningfully boosts financial health. 
Uh, no, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, we are coming up against time, uh, but I hope that was really useful for the audience. Uh, thank you to all our panelists for those great presentations, for sharing your thoughts as well as your work on financial health, both from a research standpoint, but also from a programming perspective. Um, I hope we were able to cement the approach of financial health through this panel discussion and also uh, give the audience some insight into what they could do with this approach. It's a pleasure to be hosting this event on financial health um, in the context we find ourselves in uh, with COVID-19 in the background. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Over thank to you, all. Latika. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I agree. I couldn't uh, agree more with you, Audrey. I think uh, it has given such some great insights, uh, not only to our delegates, but also to me as a learning. And uh, I'm sure it goes uh, unsaid that during these uncertain times, uh, it is so important to make sure your, your uh, financial well-being, financial health is uh, in place. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, a heartfelt gratitude to our sponsors as well, uh, Credit Watch, Ibotech, uh, SBI Mission Fund, Bank of India, ID Sign, and PayPoint. Thank you, everyone who's joined us from a uh, different part of the world, uh, especially all the panelists. Uh, like I said, have a great night, uh, have a great day, have a great evening, and uh, please make sure that you tune in again for our last session for today or for the sessions tomorrow and for the exhibition as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.